Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the panel discussion, The Future of uh, Democracy. My name is Jus Siegel. I'm the chief curator of the Winter Museum in Culver City, which is a museum that focuses on art and culture in the socialist countries during the Cold War period. And in the museum, uh, in our programs and exhibitions, we always focus on meaningful connections between the past and the present. And logically, uh, the future of democracy and even the current state of democracy is very high on our agenda, uh, especially now in times of uh, uh, growing authoritarian trends worldwide, conspiracy theories, alternative facts, and serious challenges to democratic values and institutions. And we are very happy and grateful to be able to discuss these topics these important topics with uh, our eminent uh, guests, Tom Ginsberg and Nathan Gardels, who will be properly introduced by our moderator today, Kimberly Marteau Emerson. And uh, Kimberly um, has been for quite some time now a very dear and I want to say inspirational friend of the Winter Museum. She holds uh, degrees from UCLA, UC Hastings College of the Law, and l'Université de Droit d'Aix Marseille. She was an executive of, at Sony Entertainment before entering the State Department. And among other things, uh, there she became the senior political appointee and spokesperson for the US Information, Information Agency under the Clinton administration. She is now on the board of directors of Human Rights Watch and various other public uh, advisory councils. Last year, uh, by the way, uh, Kimberly and her husband, John Emerson, who was the former U.S. ambassador in Germany, did an interview with our student council in uh, the series In Search of Truth, which was really amazing. And I think my colleague Gina is putting the link to that interview in the chat right now. Kimberly, we are so uh, happy to have you with us, and you are always such an important uh, discussion partner for us. Before I hand it over, I would like to mention that after about 45 minutes, we will start the Q&A. So uh, for the viewers, if you have any questions and you can, can put them under the Q&A at any moment, but please keep them short and concise, not more than two or three sentences. And um, in the last part of uh, the program, uh, Kimberly will open it up for public questions. But with that, without further ado, Kimberly, please uh, start the program. Thank you so much, Yos. Uh, I just want to extend my thanks to you and to Justin Jampol and the Venda Museum for inspiring and hosting this conversation today, which comes at a very timely moment. Let me also thank and introduce my two special guests who I will be in conversation with for about 40 minutes, and I hope everyone will have questions um, because it's not often you get to bring together two such experts and interesting minds on these issues of the future of democracy. Uh, so let me start by introducing Tom. Tom's truly an expert on our topic tonight. He's the Leo Spitz Distinguished Service Professor of International Law at the University of Chicago, where he also holds an appointment in the Political Science Department. His latest book is Democracies and International Law, which won best book prizes from the International Law Association and the American Society for International Law. He served as a legal advisor at the Iran US Claims Tribunal in The Hague and has consulted with numerous international development agencies and governments on legal and constitutional reform. He also happens to be a distant cousin of mine. <laughs> Um, now, let me turn to Nathan Gardells. Nathan has a long history as a thought leader on social and political issues. He is currently editor-in-chief of Noema Magazine, a publication of the Berggruen Institute, which he co-founded and is a senior advisor to. He previously served as editor-in-chief to special publications, partnered with both the Washington Post and then the LA Times Syndicate Tribune Media. And he was an editor of New Perspectives Quarterly, which is, I think, when you came into my life, um, the Journal of Social and Political Thought published by Blackwell Oxford. I'm really pleased to be in conversation with both of you tonight because 
without trying to sound overly dramatic, I think we can agree that democracy is in an extremely fragile place. It's being attacked from the outside by external forces that include long existing and now rising authoritarian governments, which according to a recent survey on global trends at Human Rights Watch and other institutions, these, these, these types of government offer a populist social contract pledging to protect their populations from an unstable world by offering security and economic prosperity in exchange for reduced political freedoms or means of accountability. These governments are sustained by and perpetuate narratives of grievance and fear, which justify their repressive measures or failure to actually deliver improvements. Ethnic or religious nationalisms have also proliferated in many countries, often underpinned by a version of the mythical great replacement theory, a corrosive vision often amplified by social media disinformation that justifies the demonization of outsiders to protect a majority supposedly under some kind of demographic threat. Beyond that, disenchantment with the experiment of democracy around the world is palpable. Not as an idea, democracy is an idea and a political system rooted in freedom, tolerance, human rights, fairness, equity, free markets, representative government, and rule by and for the people. This is the democracy that seemed inexorable, unstoppable after the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and the Soviet Union broke up. And it remains a magnet, at least in our idea of it. Yet democracies become dysfunctional. In practice, outcomes, political solutions, stalemates, polarization, distrust, hypocrisy, double standards between what we say and what we do, and misinformation spun through populist narratives. In practice, it's arguably failed not only those of us who live squarely under its umbrella, but contributed to pushing the global South and other nations away and into the realm of economically powerful digital authoritarian states like China. So that's the landscape. I wanna begin with both of you by having you diagnose the patient. How are both of you viewing the state of democracy today? And why don't we start with Tom here? And then Nathan, I would also like to have you chime in on this question. Terrific, thank you, Kimberly. And it's, it's wonderful to be here with everyone. Um, and yes, that is indeed uh, an important question. I'll just uh, start by just reporting a fact, which is according to virtually every measure of global democracy, the number of countries that were democracies in the world begin to decline around 2006 and has declined every year since then. Um, and about 2017, the number of non-democracies exceeded the number of democracies for the first time in um, several decades. And in addition, of course, the number of people living under non-democracy has also risen to be more than half the world's population. And we have these very big kind of ambiguous cases like India, uh, which, you know, according to many rankings, has left the realm of competitive elections um, that we can argue about particular cases. But the big point is that, yes, there is, uh, you know, the, the patient is sick, uh, the reputation is poor. And there's not even really a consensus on the causes here. I mean, there's some who would say that um, uh, polarization that's driven largely by the social media, actually, we do see a beginning of polarization that really increases with the rise of the like button in Facebook and Twitter, because that allowed us to start segmenting our media, our personal media environments and that sort of allows others, entrepreneurs, to allow us to demonize the other side. So that's certainly part of it. Inequality and you know lack of um, uh, you know response to globalization, and I think you know the rise of China as a kind of at some very broad level um, a, a model. I don't think it's a it's really a model, but the idea of a very powerful, successful state that is not at all committed to democracy has I think helped in many particular cases. Um, so things aren't great. Um, I just want to make one other introductory comment, then it'll be comment quiet. But um, 
it's it's, it's important to remember that even though the general trend is bad, there are some bright sides. There are individual stories. Um, there are what I call near misses, countries where democracy seemed to be about to end and then something happened to reverse it. And I think we learn a lot from those cases and I could talk more about them, but uh, the general trend, very poor. Thank you. Um, Nathan? Yeah, let me uh, focus a little more on, on the dynamics I see behind uh, the landscape that, that we see today. Um, and I think it's an analysis that holds across most dysfunctional democracies. Populism uh, was not the, is not the cause of today's crisis of governance. It's a symptom of the decay of democratic institutions captured by organized special interests of an insider establishment that failed to address the dislocation of globalization and the disruption of rapid technological change. That resulted in uh, a breach of distrust between the public and the institutions of self-government. Uh, there are, are two competing alternative to closing this gap. Uh, the first, you, you obviously mentioned, uh, uh, populist uh, authoritarian leaning uh, uh, leaders and, and movements. Uh, popul populists present themselves and fashion themselves as tribunes of the people, uh, the embodiment of the general will or the majority will, and any constraints on their power they see as a ruse, a contrivance by elites, by suspect min minorities, uh, to keep the masses down. Uh, in effect, they have transmuted a revolt against a morbid political class into a revolt against the institutions of democratic governance itself, separation of powers, rule of law, et cetera. Um, we see, I just came from Mexico. Uh, it's happening in Mexico uh, where President Oba, Lo, Lopez Obrador uh, is trying to dismantle the independent electoral commission. We see it in Israel, we see it in Hungary, we see it in Poland. And of course, uh, during the Trump years, uh, we saw it in the US. So the one alternative is this drift towards authoritarianism uh, where populist leaders fashion themselves as the embodiment of the people, uh, as tributes to the people. The other alternative that's competing and we see happening around the world is deeper citizen engagement uh, to close that gap of trust between the public and institutions of self-government. Um, the uh, examples I would use for would be uh, in Europe citizens assemblies. Uh, the idea is that uh, new mediating institutions uh, need to need to uh, be built uh, that uh, foster the involvement of the broader civil society in governance, like I said, through citizen assemblies as a complement to representative government. Um, so in France, you've seen a, a citizen assembly uh, reach consensus on climate change. On, uh, in Ireland, you've seen citizen assemblies that reached a consensus on abortion in that very Catholic country. Uh, the European Union has uh, sponsored and hosted citizen assemblies for citizens to deliberate about the future course of Europe. So these are, are, are the two alternatives I see on the landscape. Uh, and I, I would add one other thing, though, that uh, as I, as I uh, wrote about just last week about Mexico, uh, it's not enough to defend the integrity of the institution of democracy in a procedural way, meaning protecting uh, separation of powers, rule of law, and so on. Liberal democracy has to show it can deliver for the constituencies of populism that would undermine it. And uh, you alluded a little bit to that. Kimberly, uh, and I think the two must go together. You've got to defend the institutions, but you've got to deliver to the to the constituencies that are behind the drift towards authoritarianism. So interesting. Okay, so you you kind of were getting to my second question, which was, you know, like assuming democracies democracy is worth fighting for, um, which I would argue it is. Like, what do we need to do? And it sounds to me like you're suggesting that this citizen engagement is one way to do it. And the other way to do it is that the institutions have to deliver. Yeah. And so it seems like there are two 
two, two things that need to be, it, can you, have you, you're, you've given some examples of citizen engagement in other parts of the world. How, where, do you see anything on the landscape, for example, in the United States? Well, uh, actually, uh, well, at the local level, I should say at the local level, yes. I mean, one of the dynamics going on is that as things drift more towards authoritarianism at the top, all around the world, you see more uh, direct democracy, participatory, participatory democracy, participatory budgeting at the local levels. Uh, in the United States, uh, obviously, California uh, has the direct democracy system, uh, and it's more or less been hijacked by organized special interests um, instead of by the public. And there are efforts underway there to ensure that the citizens actually have a role. I mean, just for example, uh, we, we in California, we have the recall, the initiative, and the referendum. Uh, referendum is for citizens who are dissatisfied with the law to have a recourse to challenge it. Uh, what's happened in California is private organized special interests will try to overturn laws by the elected uh, legislature. Uh, and um, if I, a, a case in point is Uber and Lyft. Uh, a couple of years ago, the, the legislature passed a law that would make contractors into employees. Uh, Uber and Lyft didn't like that for obvious reasons. Uh, they put $224 million uh, in a referendum campaign to sway the public uh, to vote uh, in their favor, and their stock price went up $31 billion, uh, $13 billion the next day. The point I'm making is that uh, there are mechanisms for more citizen engagement that have been captured by organized special interests, and there are moves to uh, to unravel that. Uh, in, but on terms of citizen assemblies, for example, or more formal uh, uh, mechanisms of citizen engagement, deliberative, not direct democracy, you do see them all across Europe, uh, as I mentioned, in France and uh, in Ireland and at the EU level. But the U.S. is kind of behind on that. Uh, and one of the reasons behind on that is because many states, 28 states, have direct democracy mechanisms, uh, all of which are subject to corruption by the same kind of dynamic I just, I just mentioned. So in this sense, I think Europe is ahead of the U.S. Um, and so let me, let me turn to you, Tom, and, and ask you, number one, you know, what you think of this, is this, you know, idea, Nathan's, you know, talking about direct democracy and uh, deliberative democracy involving citizens. Is this viable? And, and, and if it is, or if it even if it isn't, do you have any other thoughts on how we can kind of hope that we can improve democracy, strengthen it? Uh, and I'm thinking particularly like domestically right now, we'll, we'll turn and talk about the world in a second. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think they're related. So first of all, the, this, this literature and experiments in reinventing democracy are very exciting, but uh, they are inherently, in my view, limited. That is, they're, they're good supplements to the basic system, but there's no substitute for the system of mass electoral democracy, for better or worse. Um, and and I just point out that we've never really been able, we have these great experiments, Ireland that nation, Nathan mentioned. There was one in British Columbia where the citizens deliberated over changing their electoral system, decided not to. Um, you know, they're really good stories, but I don't really see how we could scale them up because of the general problem of democracy, which we've known about since the 18th century, which is, you know, most citizens don't want to spend a lot of time on governance. They need representation. So my view is that these things should be View, these should be used for really specific major questions um, and work as a kind of tiebreaker. And the Ireland abortion story really is a great story in that sense. They got citizens together and they deliberated for a while. And then those citizens made a recommendation by a two thirds majority actually. And then um, a mass referendum blessed their decision. It's a great story, but you got to reserve it. And the California story shows what happens when it becomes routine, right? In the United States, of course, many of our mecha mechanisms of uh, institutional integrity come through the initiative and referendum. So the states which have um, nonpartisan electoral commissions, which are really important, they have fairer elections, more responsive elections than the states which don't, all of those came about through citizen initiative. And so 
It is a really important part of our story, but I just think it needs to be channeled. And I don't quite know how to do that constitutionally, but it's something we have to do. Well, I don't, yeah. well I think, as I said, there, uh, I think these uh, institutions of citizen engagement, uh, mediating institutions are complements of representative government, not a replacement for representative government. Yeah. But in a place like California, they actually frame what representative government can do. Redistricting in California by independent commission, as opposed by the legislature, uh, was put in place by a citizen's ballot initiative because they wanted to have nonpartisan competition, not, not, not uh, 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 districts drawn by those on one, one side or the other. Um, and so they're really critical for setting the framework uh, for mass electoral democracy. And all, and, and I'll just one one of the technical point on the on the citizen assembly. Yes, uh, people don't have time. They have family, have work to participate. That's why you need representation. So the key element of these citizen assemblies is what they call mini publics, and this has been practiced over and over again. Is they uh, through scientific you know, polling methods, you, you select bodies that are indicative of the public as a whole, race, gender, region, et cetera, et cetera, that then uh, advise the public on a nonpartisan point of view or a consensus that can help uh, actually uh, the, the elected representatives. So in the, case of, um, in the case of Taiwan, for example, where they do this even digitally, um, the fact that there's been these mini publics that reach consensus almost compels the legislature to design their legislation according to uh, uh, the outcome of these citizen assemblies. Um, and I would have said one, one other point, uh, the short, where I do agree with you, the shortcoming of citizen assemblies, at least so far, like in Europe, they're advisory, they're deliberative, and they bring everyone together to try to reach consensus, but they're advisory and it's up to the legislative authorities to do or not do what, what they say. It was an interesting experience, uh, experiment in Ost Belgium, west the German part of Belgium, where actually the, the parliament is required to respond to the assembly, explain why they can't do what they propose, how they, why would they amend it, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, with direct democracy, it is binding. But the problem with direct democracy, not just in California, but in, in all of the states, is there's no institutional deliberation. So where there's binding decisions and direct democracy, there's not deliberation. Where there's, a, there's advisory deliberations, they're not binding. So one, aspect, so, one element is to bring the, those two things uh, together, again, as a complement to representative government and often a framing of representative government and what it can do. Well, I mean, what, you know, what I like is knowing that there's a couple of people out there like yourselves who are actually thinking about this and, 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 and watching these experiments and seeing what's successful, not successful. But I want to kind of turn a little bit because Tom, I know that I remember you saying something about like, you felt that something and direction that we might need to go in order to strengthen our democracy is to figure out how to depolarize um, depolarize our, our society. And I wanted to explore that a little bit with you. Can you talk a little bit about like, how would we do that? How do we actually bring people back together? Yeah, it's a hundred million dollar question. And there's some really interesting, again, like uh, uh, and Nathan's describing with, uh, citizens initiatives. There's some experiments out there, groups, local groups that get together and talk across difference, across party lines. I'm actually starting something at the University of Chicago to try to get students to do this more because we are learning that our students in this generation are extremely afraid to express themselves. They're afraid of getting canceled. They're afraid they might say something wrong. They're afraid of not getting into law school. And so, you know, that's then we're failing in our duty. So um, we've got to do something about it. Um, but I don't have any magic bullet for depolarization. I mean, it, in the end, it is um, a matter of politics, of showing competence. I think what Nathan said about the poor performance of small D democratic governance in many systems is really what's driving the underlying causes. And I think at the end of the day, you've got to deal with that 
in order to, um, to depolarize. But it's extremely fraught time because you also have all the misinformation and the, you know, really bad. Well, that, of course, and that that is somehow there has to be a, a reining in or an ethics framework for social media. One idea that I heard was that um, the polarization in part uh, was a symptom of globalization because, you know, it allowed for uh, a lot of uh, uh, folks taking, you know, op opponent feeling like that that was part of the distrust of institutions that grew because no longer were our countries, you know, was our government taking care of it, their, its people. And so I, I actually heard, and I'd be curious what you guys think about this, that, that, that actually uh, deglobalization through investment, through our, this kind of industrial policy that, that, that the Biden administration has been pursuing through the passage of the Infrastructure Act, um, that this might actually take away some of the fuel that people have felt um, at least across America um, in in the past years, in the past couple of decades. Um, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, 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 let me just respond to one thing Tom said, then I'll answer that. You know, on these experiments about consensus and depol uh, pol uh, depolarization in Taiwan, I mean, one of the problems with electoral democracy, mass electoral democracy, uh, once polarization enters, is it's winner take all uh, and uh, uh, the partisan fever uh, exacerbate, electoral policy exacerbates the partisan fever, which you don't get in these kind of mini assemblies or citizen assemblies where the whole point is to try to reach consensus. In Taiwan, for example, uh, Audrey Tang, the digital minister, um, uh, has online deliberative processes where you should actually you can actually show over a period of days where there's discussion among citizens how they come together uh, uh, into consensus. Uh, for example, when they were talking about Uber and Lyft, by things like, let's make these cars this color, these cars that color, you, you, you remove the kind of, um, what do you call it, the kind of triggers uh, of polarization uh, by approaching the problem in a different way. Same-sex marriage, they resolve by talking about the rights of, of same-sex parents for children, as opposed to talking about same-sex marriage. So I think these experiments are very interesting uh, uh, out there. Uh, to your question, uh, Kimberly, absolutely, I think so. That's when I, when I said that liberal democracy has to deliver. Uh, here I give Joe Biden credit. Um, Biden has gone, has tread where Trump only tweeted in terms of uh, dealing with uh, the concerns uh, and the constituencies of populism. The Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, uh, most of the benefit of the jobs and, and uh, economic growth that comes out of that will be in the red states, uh, in the non-college educated working uh, uh, communities where a lot of these investments will take place. I definitely think that helps uh, undercut the populist fervor. Uh, that's, a, that's an example of, deli of delivering to the constituencies of populism. Uh, we'll see how it rolls out. But I think that's that's its promise because again, Trump just tweeted about it. Biden is actually doing it. Okay, thank you. And Tom, if did you have something you wanted to? Did it's you okay. want to comment on? All right. So then I then I what I would like to do, you guys, is to actually now um, go up a little bit higher and take a look uh, abroad because clearly, you know, we've got our issues with democracy in the United States, and you, you've already used some examples from abroad about how some countries are dealing with it, but there's there's some big picture issues that have been taking place. And one of them, of course, is the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And so <laughs> I'd like to turn to you know, the violation of post-World War II agreements, the the UN Charter, which says countries would respect each other's borders and sovereignty. And that was a real basis for kind of spreading democracy in the world. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that nations would respect the human rights of their own peoples. And of course, since this, this, this program is being hosted by the Wendon Museum, uh, uh, you know, a 
thought-provoking institution that focuses on the Cold War, an obvious topic to reflect on is this invasion, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was not only a stark breach of the UN Charter, but also of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, under which Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal in exchange for an agreement of protection from Russia. And of course, the great violation of all of the covenants, uh, human rights covenants in the context of the brutal war crimes that Russia has prosecuted against the Ukrainian people. So I wanted to just start maybe with Tom, because you do so much in international law, about how Putin's war on Ukraine has impacted the relevance of democracy. Um, because, you know, from what I hear, it's both. It has, it's had both a good impact and also a negative impact. So can you explore that a little bit? Well, certainly in the short term, it's put the West back together as a concept where, you know, Trump sort of had a frontal attack on that, that set of alliances. Um, and so it does seem like there is a return to the idea that democracies are to work together to defend democracies. At the same time, the reaction around the world has not been that positive. Now it's mixed. After the invasion, 140 something countries voted to condemn the Russian aggression in the United Nations General Assembly. Every nation cares about its territorial integrity and doesn't want its neighbors to be free to just gobble it up on spurious excuses. So there was a bit of a consensus there. But as time's gone on, we've seen you know big democracies. Uh, I don't know if you want to include India or not, but other countries are sort of slipping away, and particularly you know those in Africa, I think, have the attitude, oh, these are just the white people killing each other again, you know, <laughs> which is a kind of odd uh, inversion of the Western attitude towards Rwanda and such. So um, I do think in general, it's been in the short term good for making democracy relevant again. I want to say something else, though, which is it is reflective of a broader trend that we see in governance, which is, generally speaking, democracies innovate. They come up with new concepts, rights, you know, election commissions, Nathan's, uh, the, the experiments in um, citizen democracy that Nathan was talking about. These are innovations that occur in democracies. But what we see over and over again is that those things are copied and co-opted and then repurposed by authoritarians. And I think you could say that about international law. International law, of course, has this long tradition of territorial integrity. Um, and we've seen China in recent years really get into the institutions of international law, the Human Rights Commission, the UN machinery, and try to repurpose those norms as, you know, famous one, human rights with Chinese characteristics. Chinese Communist Party is actually giving seminars on democracy in Africa now. Um, and it's relevant to Ukraine because Putin, I think, is very effectively, being a lawyer himself, tried to repurpose international law in favor of what he's doing. And the way that works is the strategy of creating these fake republics and then um, uh, you know, recognizing them. And now all of a sudden you're engaged in collective self-defense, which is legal under the UN Charter, mm. giving passports to those people. So now you're defending your nationals abroad, which of course there's a long tradition of. So it's a very sort of cynical strategy, but um, one which is gonna probably have enduring effect within the um, traditional world of international law as well just because of the authoritarian repurposing. So I think it's a critical moment. Yeah, yeah. and and is there anything the West can do to, um, you know, basically maybe less in the, in the Russian, what the Russians are do doing, what Putin's doing, but, you know, with China going into the different international organizations and multilateral organizations and basically trying to change the rules and um is there can we can we play a bigger role there i mean can the west play a bigger role there well the americans have been particularly bad because every four years or eight years we elect a president who withdraws from many of these things and says oh it's all you know the black helicopters or something and the fact is you might not like it but it is there and uh, it requires engagement and it requires leadership. So I just think, you know, every administration has to commit to engaging with these institutions, even though they're, you're not going to get your way all the time, and to calling out these um, attempts to, you know, repurpose and rebrand things when they occur. And I think, again, 
this administration has done a better job, obviously, than the last one, but even better than the Obama administration at playing a very active role because it recognizes the problem. The fear, of course, is that we won't be consistent. And this is why I think American sort of leadership has uh, lost a lot of credibility. But we're not the only player. And one of the things that going on in the world is that these mid-tier democracies, Indonesia, Brazil has just like us come through an amazing election, very close election that was actually remarkably peaceful because of the institutions, um, you know, that they, I think, are going to be the leaders in some sense because uh, we're, not, we're not always minding this story. Yeah, Nathan, did you have anything you wanted to add? To well, that? I would. I would agree. The the first thing you said, <clears throat> you know, after uh, 9-11, I did an interview with Sam Huntington, uh, Clash of Civilizations, uh, Harvard professor's famous thesis, uh, who said then that 9-11 has given the West back its identity. Uh, Ukraine invasion has given the West back its democratic identity, and I think that's consolidated the West, as you as you said. But the consolidation of the West is a dynamic uh, which also um, is compelling the revolt against the uh, liberal world order by everyone else. Um, the, uh, I, I remember seeing uh, online somewhere or on, on TV, Putin smirking at the criticism of, oh, you invaded without the, you know, this is against the UN rules. And he said, oh, do you remember Iraq? OK, so all those countries out there, I agree with you. There's a middle countries that are kind of uh, the battleground, almost like during the Cold War. Uh, uh, and it's not a foregone conclusion that they'll agree with the West's interpretations of international institutions as opposed to, uh, to China and Russia's. And uh, <clears throat> China will. China's been pushing for, on the IMF, for example, China's been pushing for two decades for a greater voice in the IMF, which has been denied by the West. So all of these things come up, all, all these past uh, permutations of the West manipulating international law in its interest, as is seen by the rest of the world, is now coming back to haunt the, the attempt to um, to uh, deny the legitimacy of what China and Russia are claiming uh, internationally. And I see this completely with China. China is in the UN. Uh, we, our, we have a group that goes to China every year, meets Xi Jinping. They always talk about international law. They talk about the UN. You know, the UN, we don't want to overthrow the system. The UN is the system we want. They just want their role in it. Reshape it, yeah. right, in, in the way that they want. Well, they have well, a uh, they have a veto right after all. Right. Well, oh. that raises the question of whether there should be Security Council reform. <laughs> and I would argue yes. Um, I don't know what the next shape should be, but um, but that well, at this moment, if you brought in Brazil and India, it wouldn't shift the balance. If you brought in Brazil, India, India, and South Africa you would have the same vote in the Security Council as you have with China and Russia today. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because that brings me to this, um, this question about, you know, the fact that, you know, the four most populous, or not the four, but the most populous countries in the world, you know, like India, South Africa, Nigeria, um, Pakistan, okay, I'm not going to count China in this because we know China has not not been a part of it, but the ones that you call the middle countries um, and are, you know, quote unquote democracies um, uh, did not join the sanctions regime against Russia. And, you know, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the risks that they're not being part of this. I mean, you're absolutely right, Nathan. Um, and you mentioned this too, Tom. Um, you know, there's a there's a reaction going on. How do we how do we bring these folks? How do we bring these middle countries? I mean, the question is, should we? Do we? Is this is this the right framework? Should we be bringing trying to 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 convince these countries that democracy is the way to go? How do we even convince them? Because 
there's a lot of democracy was such a magnet when the wall came down that countries rushed to follow. And now, of course, because of hypocrisy and double standards, many are standing back. Um, I think you have to repair thyself is the answer. Um, you know, along the lines we're talking about, deepening citizen engagement, getting rid of this distrust between the public and, uh, and uh, institution of self-government, show that democracy works and can deliver. When I was in Mexico last week, um, uh, after the Congress voted to basically gut the Electoral Commission, uh, the ambassador there, Ken Salazar, US ambassador there, Ken Salazar said, uh, we believe in strong institutions. He didn't directly criticize, he said, we believe in strong institutions for democracy. And the response of Lobos Obrador, the president, was Mexico is more democratic than the U.S., which is an oligarchy. So unless you get past that uh, framing of reality, I don't see how you're going to bring the, the global south along. That's a big uh, ask because, of course, many of our, you know, the U.S. is basically set up for minority rule, and it's no accident that we've had two uh, presidents, you know, elected this century without majority vote, um, and we will probably continue to have that from time to time. And so, you know, it's a very easy critique for a country like Mexico to say, you guys aren't really a democracy. I study institutions. I care a lot about them. I was talking before about countries where you see, like, backsliding and democracy is about to end and something happens. What is it that saves countries in those circumstances? Well, think about January 6th or January 7th, actually. What is it that saved our bacon? It was the military not stepping in and actually letting the commander in chief know in advance that they would not obey an order to overthrow the democracy. It was a million, you know, back in November, you know, not a million, 10,000 local offices uh, you know, local electoral institutions at states that counted the votes in the face of great intimidation in some places. A lot of people doing their duty according to the rule of law. It was the courts, uh, you know, throwing out all the spurious lawsuits. So the interesting thing about all those institutions I mentioned, none of them are legitimated democratically, and yet they're all essential for democracy. And so that's a kind of story which is really hard to sell you know, you know, no one's going to run out in the streets and say, oh, yes, I love, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's a it's hard to figure out how to get coalitions to build them. We don't know that much about how they're sustained, but they are critical. And I think the one place where you really see that today is Israel, where you have 180,000 people in the streets, you know, many of whom don't really like the court. The court has made a lot of mistakes, but they recognize that this is an attack on the system of checks and balances and that without uh, a Supreme Court to speak of, which is really what the coalition is proposing, things would be really, um, there wouldn't be constraints on government. So they see it as the moment, and they've all showed up. So that's the kind of thing which you need. But it's hard to get an affirmative coalition to invest in the institutions in advance. Well, and also so many of these protests are, they're not really led, they're not organized or led, they are spontaneous. I mean, the 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 protest in China is, you know, another example of that. We've seen um, several protests in Iran um, where there's a recognition of, you know, our freedom, our freedom. People still want freedom. That is, to me, what remains the guiding light of why, you know, um, democracy remains a magnet. Um, let me, it's it's now a quarter of the hour, so I'm going to, I have some more questions, but I'm going to turn to the audience questions at this point. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I'm going to start with a question. Um, I haven't really had a chance to super read it yet, but from Linus Kojelis, um, that says, perhaps this is an America-centric question, but could there be a relationship between the change in generations? from greatest generation baby boomers to millennials X, Y, and even the post-1990 peace dividend, and at least American perception of the value of democracy. So you have this change in generations, and then you have this peace dividend after 99, 1990, and 
our perception of the value of democracy. And millennials and generations X and Y never felt a strategic threat to the US or a Soviet threat to the West, um, Europe and, or to Western Europe and other areas around the world. So could this, these younger generations be soft on democracy and a bit focused on their self, cell phones, social media, as PC woke, as opposed to the importance of broad principles of democracy, such as respect of basic human civil rights, including freedom of speech? So I think- Can I jump in and say something about it? Yes. Because it's, it's a good question. And you know, I don't know the data. I mean, there is some data on this, which says that uh, young people tend to support, you know, I think- few years ago, one out of six young people think it's okay for the military to rule directly in the United States. But it's hard to know whether that's a um, cohort effect or just an uh, age effect. That is, people tend to have kind of, all of us, you know, little wacky ideas when we're young and we, we grow out of them. Um, I do think one bit of counter evidence, and it's a kind of, you might think an odd example, but actually is the Black Lives Matter protests, the biggest protests the United States has ever had. And set aside, you know, the violence, uh, small elements of it, set aside the media characterization of it. That's, you know, 25 million Americans, uh, you know, in, on, in various forms coming out and basically saying it's not okay for the state to lynch someone because of their race. So that shows a sense of engagement. And um, that's the, how you channel such movements into electoral politics is the challenge for, and that that's the mystery. That's the art of politics is taking that energy and having sustained engagement in productive ways. Interesting. Nathan, did you have anything you wanted well, to? Well, I, I think the, ge the general point I'd make is that, um, you know, um, <clears throat> Arnold Toynbee writing about the rise and fall of civilizations talked about uh, civilization respond to challenges and either they fail <laughs> or they succeed. But it's a, it's a challenge, which, uh, like I said before about Huntington, you know, 9-11 gave, Amer gave Americans back their identity. When there's a challenge, there's a response. And I think that was, that was the situation in uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, we had Obama as president, and then all of a sudden we have this in the same country. Uh, people responded to something deeply. In China, in China, uh, I think it was the same way. I mean, the the adaptive quality of, of the uh, authoritarianism kind of diminished under Xi, who, who centralized his rule, and people had no way to express themselves through the system, so they went out into the streets because there was a challenge to them. And uh, so that's the positive side that I see, where there's a challenge to response of, of generations. Um, but I also wonder, for, for the younger generations, I suppose, um, you can't imagine war land war, ground war, like we had World War II. You had generations that built the, they were building the integration of Europe, generations that uh, uh, built the post-Cold War, post-war America, who experienced real wars and the, and the danger of real wars. And that has disappeared for these generations. So without that experience, it's hard to mobilize against something you've never experienced uh, and that perhaps you can't imagine. So. Uh, all of these things, like going back to Israel, too, it, it's like uh, the conclusion is not foregone. Uh, okay. Tendencies, and if you push the right button, you get resistance. In Mexico, there are 100,000 people marched in the street also against these, uh, these uh, uh, moves by Lopez Obrador. Uh, and it's not always clear ahead of time which button, like Black Lives Matter, what button is going to set it off. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose the, the final point on that is that's why a free civil society is so is so critical uh, right. because the yeah. civil society, as you mentioned, these are not or orchestrated uh, demonstrations or orchestrated eruptions. They're organic eruptions because civil society has the freedom to move. So once that's gone, like that, that's why Putin wants to destroy civil society. That's why the Chinese party wants to be the only authority and, and not have any free civil society, because then there's no challenge. Which is what's so interesting about the COVID protests in China, because they let them go and they didn't crush them. And I don't know if that's also related to why, because everybody was watching or, you know, because they still care about their, how they're perceived in the world. 
Well, in my view, it goes back to what Tom was saying about social media. I mean, the interesting thing about that eruption in China, it spread like wildfire, even though uh, the hit and miss censorship, uh, you know, whack-a-mole censorship, it spread like wildfire across the entire country because the, the country was so ready for it. And the usual channels of the party adapting to public concern, because they're always polling, they're always spying, they always want to know where the public is, they miss the beat. Uh, but it wasn't long before it was shut down. Mm. It doesn't mean it's yeah. gone away. It just means right. it's not negative. Right. But they did it without a Tiananmen Square moment, right. which is interesting. Right. Um, so here's a question from uh, John Emerson. He's curious as to how democracy can deliver on populist needs when much of what drives populism is grievance against educated elites, corporations, immigrants, and government in general, plus a sense that the world is changing and they're being left behind. So the bottom line is, how does democracy deliver on populist needs? Given well, the I, I said before, I think Biden's economic policies are responding to the constituencies. And I think that's on the substantive level, on a, uh, on a political communication level, uh, John, you were uh, ambassador to Germany. Uh, Olaf Scholz, what was his big theme in the campaign? His big theme was respect for the little guy, respect for people who don't, you know, who the elites look down upon. The I, I use, I forget his terms, cosmopolitan elites or global fashion elites, or you know, respect the 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 clerk, the mechanic. That was like a big theme of his campaign, and he won on that basis. I, I mean, so. I think there's a, re as a, and I think Biden does the same thing, by the way. It's a respect uh, for the average working person and not looking down upon them as cosmopolitan elites. That was a big part of the revolt against globalization, a big part of the Trump ressentiment. Uh, and I, I think if you move that from the political discourse, you, you move in the right direction. Tom. There's a big, big point about political economy here. You know, Reagan gets all the credit for the deregulation trend, which is kind of petering out now. And it actually started under Carter. Uh, Biden, historians will look back and say what Biden did was to continue some of Trump's policies. He hasn't made major immigration reform as the left wing of his coalition wants him to do. He's continued with industrial policy and deepened it, as Nathan just said. And, um, you know, this is a major shift. This is a, a major shift in the way the U.S. economy is organized that I think, you know, takes time to work itself out. But it is a kind of a deglobalization. And what that means for the international institutions is going to be interesting to watch. Um, I, you know, the one little bit of it I wish we could go back and do a little better would be to have extended trade privileges to the small democracies and the regional organizations like in West Africa and such that have done a pretty good job in difficult circumstances promoting and protecting democracy, we should have really reached out to them and, and, and made it clear that you get a benefit from voting with us. By the time the Ukraine thing came around, we didn't have any credibility on that. So that would have been a different way to run policy in the 90s and 2000s. Hopefully we're looking back and learning some lessons um, because... Yeah, that's a really interesting suggestion. Um, let's, let's don't be naive. Nation building means excluding others. So we, what we have is on a, a competitive nation building. We have uh, Macron in France and Olaf Scholz, again, mention him. We need our own subsidies because the U.S. is shutting us out. So let's don't be naive. Nation building and responding to the constituents of populism has the consequences uh, that Trump may be, uh, Trump's rhetoric elicited uh, in the discourse, but not in the reality. Thanks, good, good point. All right, we've got more questions than I think we have time for, but um, I'm gonna start with Rodney Punts, who, which I see in the regular chat. Uh, given Tom's observation that the U.S. is set up for minority rule, in quote, and Nathan's admonishment to repair thyself, what is the path for the USA to rid itself of the Electoral College, which is perpetuating a minority conservative oligarch rule in 
contrast to where the majority of American people are on a progressive federal legislation to move us onto contemporary hopes and needs for our people. So well, yeah, there's one quite quite concrete thing going on, which is the um, electoral college majority movement, which is basically a pact among the states that they will give all of their electoral votes to whoever wins the national majority. And we aren't far away in terms of the number of states that have joined that uh, from getting Didn't to- Didn't it get point stuck point. at like 180 electoral votes or yeah. is it, has it expanded since then? That was like when Trump was elected, it was already at, or right after that, it was at 180. I have not checked, but I suspect it's stuck, you know, and we need obviously to get, uh, you know, a little bit further. And so the, um, but that would be a workaround. Now, the question is, would the Supreme Court, our current Supreme Court, tolerate it? And there I have my doubts. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, you imagine the scenario where the electors show up in Washington to deliver the thing. Is the Supreme Court actually going to going to stop that? They might try to in advance. And there is a legal case working its way through. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big fan of this Supreme Court. I don't think that they are. They they reach into situations which they don't have to when they want to, and they avoid deciding things that they should, um, in my view, in quite partisan ways. So I'm not very optimistic about their role, but mm. I do think it is something that as a social movement, we could all get behind and try to advance. Mm. Interesting. I got, I think I have time. It's, I have two minutes left. And um, so let me throw out uh, Joaquim Silva, put a couple of questions. Let's see. Huh. Uh, I don't know. They're interesting questions. So I'm going to give both of them and you can decide which ones you want to answer. Um, are populist authoritarian movements using mental health as a legal pretext to polarize people further and eliminate democratic threats to those in power, such as through social engineering? The second question is, should a democratic nation threaten non-democratic nations with war and economic sanctions? to establish itself as the best way to govern humanity. Okay, so that's a comment on the Ukraine war, obviously. Well, um, maybe I'll just say something really quick about the second and give Nathan both of them if he wants it. You know, <laughs> my view is that, um, and I have the whole book about it, Democracies International Law. No, they, you, you know, the right way to establish democracy is never to invade or impose it. We have no good record of that. Sanctions also tend not to work very well. There's very few cases where they're effective. Um, so our tools are limited, but um, there's positive things that can be done. And, you know, the short answer to your question is no. Um, okay. I'll pick on the second one. I, I don't know that I have anything to say about the first question, but um, in general, my argument is, I agree completely with Tom, obviously, uh, repair thyself. It, it, the best way to um, uh, promote democracy is through the power example, not the example of power. Uh, we show our system work, our system delivers, that's the best that, that we can do. However, with globalization and trade on the sanction issue, with globalization and trade, uh, there's a conflict. Uh, with, with China, the issue with China and the United States is never before have two major, I would even call them the West and China, civilizational powers, challenged each other where the extent of their integration is actually the terrain of the contestation of the contest. Hmm. So I don't want to sanction China. I don't think it helps on certain things. However, you don't want American technology feeding into uh, the Chinese surveillance state. So I think it's completely legitimate to have strategic decoupling in the realms of information and communication uh, without an overall decoupling uh, in other realms, you make, you know, machine tools, uh, the information technology is not just another tool of production, like machine tools are a uh, factor of production, like machine tools or assembly lines. It's about the very core of the divergence between East and West. So I think there's a strategic case for decoupling. Um, uh, but idea of sanctions uh, to try to shape and change another country's internal dynamic is a losing proposition and America has enough experience in doing that from Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan to finally learn the lesson. Wow, well with you, that I, 
I, we are out of time. We're actually one minute over. And I really want to thank both of you for uh, joining me tonight or today. I'm, I'm in Europe, so it's tonight. Um, for this interesting conversation, I feel as if uh, there's many ideas here that could be explored further. I'm glad to know that, that, that Tom and Nathan, you're both out there thinking about them and, um, and working on them. And hopefully we can do this again in a year and take another look at where we are and where democracy might be and whether we, we've made any progress. And I want to thank our, our, our audience and I want to thank the Venda Museum for joining us, for hosting us, and then everyone out there for joining us tonight. And I see there are even more, more notes in the chat. I apologize we couldn't get to all of them. And I wish you all a great evening. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.